things. So yeah. We were talking about um, what are the different sins I could commit to get me kicked out of Berkeley. And I, I agree with Matt, but I'm just gonna admit this sin. I don't care if they kick me out. We were talking about pizza. Cheese board is, is the worst pizza place in the country. I'm sorry, because it's not pizza. You say sins, it makes it sound so like, we were talking about restaurants. I know, but I, it's genuinely like the, it's so beloved in the city for some reason. No. Um, but anytime, people want to go there I just make a face and I and they're just like you don't like cheese board I'm like no I, I don't like cheese board there's so many other pizza places we could go to I would literally rather go to California pizza kitchen than go to cheese board and that, that's saying something. Wow. I, wow. I, I I hate California pizza. this is a scandal yeah <laughs> this is this is this is gonna be our Yoko Ono right here it's gonna break up oh oof. so I'm just saying, this is just yeah. This is crazy. It's, it's amazing though. I mean, like people have like about pizza specifically, like people have incredibly strong opinions about which is the best and they just love, I mean, maybe, maybe it just is kind of low stakes. And, and so it is kind of a friendly argument, but people really yeah. have strong opinions about that. So, and, and every region seems to have their own pizza, right? So yeah. um, it's just, it's very, it's very odd. Yeah. It is. Um, but on that note, <laughs> Welcome to Drinking with Historians. So um, thank you everybody for, for joining us on this Friday. And um, we are very excited to, to have our guest, um, Dr. Gregory Brew, who is uh, joining us right now. Um, Greg, do you prefer Greg or Gregory? Greg's fine. Greg's fine, okay. It, it's our show, so you're, we're gonna go with Greg anyway. Um, so um, Greg is a historian of oil, modern Iran, and the Cold War. Um, his first book, uh, Petroleum and Progress, Oil Development in the American Encounter with Iran, 1941 to 1965, um, is coming out soon, I believe, with, with Cambridge University Press. Soonish. Um, Soonish, that's right. Um, he is currently associated um, with uh, Southern Methodist University. Um, and um, we're going to have a great conversation about various things. But the first question, the most important question that we're going to ask you all night, Craig, is what are you drinking tonight? So I am drinking a, uh, a whiskey called Yellow Spot, which I'm keeping it, keeping in its neat little tube right here, uh, just on the rocks, just plain old simple whiskey. I've just been sipping it for the last little while and it's delicious. I highly recommend it. Yellow Spot. If you haven't heard of it before, it comes with the Greg Brew seal of approval. Yeah. That's right. It's delicious. With ice. Varsha, I imagine Varsha knows all about it because she knows all things whiskey. So I'm glad to hear that it also has Varsha's endorsement. Is it back there? Yeah. No, it's not back there. I have Green Spot, which is um, another oh. Irish whiskey, and it's delicious too. Uh, Irish whiskey in general is really good. I only recently discovered. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm but really enjoying I, it. I'm like a little bit annoyed at the ice, but I understand it's hot and wherever you are. So I, I'll, I'll let it it's, go. It's hot. I know, I know, I know it's, it is some, uh, uh, somewhat frowned upon. It is, it's to help me make it last a little longer because otherwise I would probably just, and then there would be a pretty steady decline. Um, so this is to uh, let me keep my wits about me for a little longer so that That's I can last the entire episode. <laughs> we were talking uh, I have an eight month old daughter and she keeps me, she keeps me on my feet uh so uh so this is this is to help me keep stay on my feet the entire episode well i mean maybe, maybe Varsha, you and i should back channel a little bit but maybe that should be a goal for you know the remainder of the summer is try to get one of our guests to pass out from drinking so much so because we're yeah. just i would watch that episode <laughs> i mean everybody would watch that episode right so i mean if that doesn't work then we can just drink ourselves into oblivion and, which i mean i've done honestly pretty close to a couple times. We don't you'll know what's going to happen. Those episodes on YouTube. So. Yeah. We don't know what's going to There are happen. there are a couple of episodes where I'm just like pouring and pouring and I start hiccuping <laughs> and so like that's how you know I'm like out of it. But I, I hold it together pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Go to YouTube right now. So, Marcia, what are you drinking? I am drinking a, a new bourbon for me. It's called Lost Republic. Um I thought I'd be super California today and so it's really really good. Um and uh, I enjoy it. Yeah. How about so, you, Matt? Is that a birthday bourbon? Yes, this is the bourbon I bought for my birthday. Um, I bought a lot of other whiskeys for my birthday. I bought a rye. I bought an Irish whiskey. I bought uh, a scotch. But this bourbon was uh, especially good. I seem to remember that from, from that episode. Yeah. So. 
So um, I have I have a little bit of my um, my Woodford Reserve um, double oaked um, uh, bourbon. I, I'm not drinking it with ice. Um, you'll notice. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the same bottle I had last week, which well, yeah, it's the same bottle, but I had somehow because I'm an idiot, like broken the cork. And so I had to pour it in the mason jar. So I'm I've been working on it and I finally finished it off. I have some larceny as, as backup as the thing, as the day goes on. So, but this is, this is lovely. It's, it's, it's sweet and it's really smooth and it's very caramel and it's, it's one of my favorite bourbons. So, and um, how about you, Rachel, what are you drinking tonight? Well, I went tubing on the Delaware river yesterday. So I stocked up and I got an Allagash True Penny which is Ooh. their Pilsner. Allagash has started making different kinds of beer. You know, usually you always see Allagash White at the breweries uh -huh. or at the um, brew pubs. But yeah, they started to make True Penny. They made a river run one, but I think it was an IPA. So I stuck with the Pilsner. It's very tasty. Okay. Allagash makes some nice beers too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, excellent. So very New Englandy thing. So, or well, Northeast, I guess, Northeast. So, anyway. It always tastes so. better on the river. <laughs> I, I I can't. Yeah, I'll take your word for that. So oh, you gotta try it. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, we'll say goodbye. Um, please remember that if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A as you're watching. Um, we'll get to those in the second half hour. Um, but right now, I think uh, Varsha, you're gonna you're gonna start us off with a question for Greg. Yeah. So I I met you at Schaefer, and like the first thing that I was like super excited about is that you work on the United States and Iran, and you mentioned a little bit that you work on dams, but mainly you work on oil. And so my my first question is mostly, how did you? Why did you decide to get into U.S. Iran foreign policy? Like, how did you decide to study that in your dissertation? Uh, great. Thanks. That's a great starting question. So when I was starting my PhD, I knew I wanted to work on oil. Um, kind of as a broad topic within the study of uh, U.S. foreign relations. My advisor at Georgetown, uh, uh, Professor David Painter, oil is kind of his forte. So I was going to be working under him, and I knew oil was going to be part of my project. Um, I had an interest in the Middle East. I had taken some Arabic. Um, I was taking Persian uh, or Farsi. And I really took to uh, that, and I started kind of diving into Iranian historiography, Iranian history, and I just kind of fell in love with it. Uh, and just found it so fascinating um, as a, as sort of a, it's kind of a discrete subfield within the broader study of Middle East history. Iran is uh, so, sort of unique. You know, it's not an Arab country. It's not Turkish. It has its own language. It's ha it has its own uh, history, a very long history. Um, so there's, you know, there's an immense scholarship on Iranian history. So I was getting very into that. And initially, I was very interested in studying um, the region of uh, Khuzestan, which is southwestern Iran, which is where the oil industry is based. Uh, it's very hot. It's uh, one of the hottest places on earth, in fact. Uh, temperatures regularly exceed 120, 125 degrees in Khuzestan. Uh, and originally, Varsha, you'll be happy to hear about this. There were dams in my original project, um, a series of dams that were built in the that were going to be built in the 50s and 60s by American uh, um, engineers um, uh, run under an organization run by David Lilienthal, who I know you know very uh, of course. You know well. Um, so dams did end up kind of sneaking into my project. But what I was most interested in um, was the origins of the Iranian petrostate. So how did Iran, particularly in the 60s and 70s under the Pahlavi regime under the Shah, how did Iran become a state built around oil? Um, most specifically built around oil's wealth, right? The financial power that was derived by the production and sale of oil, um, which I found very fascinating because Iran itself as a country under the Shah for most of his reign, wasn't selling, producing or selling the oil itself. It, that job was being done by Western oil corporations and Iran was receiving royalties and taxes from these corporations. And that was the wealth that the Shah was, being, was using to uh, fund state centralization, fund modernization programs, fund uh, his uh, you know, buildup of a very large military. Um, so the origins of the Pahlavi Petrostate, which have been written about extensively uh, within the Iranian historiography, uh, once I was doing a little bit more work on that, I was finding this kind of interesting cleavage between that subject you know, what oil is doing to Iran internally and how Iran fits into this global 
oil uh, economy that is primarily being run by Western corporations. Um, so I saw there was kind of a uh, kind of a, a break between oil's local nature and what was happening globally. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. And, and of course, within Iranian history, um, there is a tremendous amount about the conflict between Iran and these cor uh, corporations, these Western companies. Most people are familiar with um, Mohammad Mossadegh, the Iranian prime minister from the early 1950s, who was overthrown in a coup in 1953, uh, a coup sponsored by the CIA and the British intelligence services. Um, and oil was a significant part of that coup uh, and of the crisis that preceded it. Um, so this conflict had been going on for a long time uh, and had played a very important role in you know, how Iranian history is generally conceived um, within the study of Iranian history. But I was finding these very interesting disconnections between what I think of as the global history of oil with the corporations where oil is this factor in international relations where the United States plays a very large role and then how oil is transforming Iran from the inside. So my project was an attempt to connect those two. So I looked at how Iran fit into a global oil economy and did a lot of research in company archives, in US diplomatic archives. Uh, I went to the BP archive in the United Kingdom, BP, of, which of course was formerly known as the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, uh, which used to run the oil industry of Iran before 1951. Uh, and then at the same time, I try to uncover the story of how oil transformed Iran internally during this period from 1941 to 1965. And what I found uh, was not only the work of Iranian uh, engineers, technocrats, uh, officials, administrators, but a tremendous amount of involvement from American uh, development firms, American non-state actors, institutions uh, like the World Bank, like Lilienthal's company, Development and Resources, uh, the Ford Foundation, Harvard University, uh, lending their, usually lending expertise, their sort of, uh, their know-how, um, in these Iranian projects of economic development. So the project, which turned into the dissertation, which is now turned into the book, uh, which is um, currently undergoing a, a post-revision clearance review at Cambridge University Press. So hopefully it will be coming out with Cambridge University Press in the near future, uh, is an attempt to tell the story of how the Iranian petrostate was born, how the Shah's government came to rely on <coughs> oil, and ultimately what the United States role in that origin story is. So could I, I was wondering if we could back up a little bit because I think for, for maybe for our viewers who aren't super familiar with kind of the history of the Middle East and kind of the, the cleavages within it is that you, you mentioned, for example, that, that Iranian history is kind of, kind of something different because it has a separate kind of distinct kind of historical path. Like, could you just talk a little bit about kind of that, that a little bit more and how that impacts kind of maybe your own work? Sure. So, so Iranian history, kind of as a, a distinct discipline, or sorry, yeah. a distinct subfield. Right. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, Iran, uh, Iranians are very proud of their history, and they like to say that it's a country. It's the, one of the oldest countries on earth. That it's been uh, a state, a polity, for thousands of years, uh, going back to the Achaemenids, the Persian Empire that invaded Greece. You know, the uh, the armies of Xerxes and Darius. Um, and that's certainly, you know, that's certainly the case, and it's reflected in Iranian historiography. Iran has its own language that's distinct from uh, the rest of the region, uh, Persian or Farsi, which uses the Arabic uh, alphabet, but which is actually Indo-European. So when you study Farsi, you'll notice that it, uh, I actually found it to be very similar to Latin, which I studied in high school. Uh, the way the sentences are or constructed, the way verbs are conjugated, it has a lot of similarities. Um, so the language is distinct. Iran's history as a nation um, reflects to a certain extent the broader history of the Middle East in the sense that during the 19th century, Iran was, it was a, an independent state. It was never formally colonized, unlike nearly every other country in the Middle East. Um, but it was under tremendous pressure from foreign actors, primarily the Russian and British empires, which if you look at a map from the 19th century, you'll see Iran under the Qajars, the Qajar Shahs. There's Iran, to the north is the Russian empire of the Tsars, and then to the southeast is the Raj, is British India. Uh, 
So it was the state, it was a buffer state that was kind of squished between, you know, large uh, warring European empires. And it struggled throughout the 19th century with um, warding off foreign influence, be that uh, military influence or economic infiltration. It wasn't always successful. In fact, very often uh, Iranian um, diplomats would kind of cozy up to one power to and then use them to counteract the other. Uh, a practice in Iranian politics that's known as positive equilibrium. So we get close to the Russians, we use them to balance out the British, and then we pivot back to the British and so on and so forth. So that was kind of how Iran lasted, survived, maintained its territorial integrity throughout much of the 19th century. Uh, and then at the beginning of the 20th century, Iran has a constitutional revolution, which happens at almost the same time as revolutions in uh, Turkey, in Mexico, in China, kind of this wave of constitutionalism that's sweeping across the world in the early 20th century happens in Iran. Um, and uh, the Shah has to accept a written constitution, the first in Iran's history, that uh, creates a parliament, creates a legislature, uh, mandates that the Shah, the king, I should say, uh, Shah is the term for the, uh, the Iranian king, um, must have his power limited. Um, and this happened in 1906. Uh, and the problem that Iran then ran into, the Iranian people, the Iranian state, was that throughout the first half of the 20th century, it continued to have to ward off uh, these large foreign um, neighbors, these large powerful neighbors, such as Russia and then the Soviet Union, and particularly Great Britain. And this was a major theme in Iranian history, running all, really all the way up until the Islamic Revolution of 1978-79, this sense that Iran is uh, under threat uh, from foreign influence and needs to be sort of strengthened, needs to be um, centralized or modernized or, or, or uh, you know, made into a stronger state in order to push away these, these influences. Where oil comes into that story is uh, in 1901, the Qajar Shah uh, is running a little bit low on cash and signs an agreement with an English uh, industrialist, an English entrepreneur named William Knox Darcy, and gives Darcy the right to search for oil pretty much anywhere in the country. And if he finds the oil, he has the right to produce it, export it, move it out of the country, and there's really nothing that the Iranian state can do about it. The agreement gives the English sort of carte blanche to exploit for oil inside the country. And this was known as a concession. This was known as a, an oil concession. And you might, as you can imagine, this upsets uh, future generations of Iranian nationalists enormously. This idea that the British have the right to kind of do whatever they want inside the country, that they have the right to control this resource that is of tremendous value. Um, and this is a running sore within Iranian domestic politics and within its relationship with, uh, with Great Britain, which continues to be an important, you know, an important country in the region all the way up until the 1950s. Um, and it's at the heart of the crisis of the 1950s. I mentioned Mohammad Mossadegh uh, and the coup of 1953. Um, this comes right after Mossadegh nationalizes the oil industry in 1951. He basically, he takes control of the British oil industry that had been there since, since Darcy in, in, in 1901. Um, so this idea of Iran kind of having its own sort of unique place in Middle East yeah. history comes out of that long tradition of being an independent state, comes out of this experience of the 19th and 20th century of warding off foreign influence, of having its own language, having its own culture, um, and particularly having this tradition of being a country that has maintained its independence, but has done so under tremendous pressure, particularly from, from foreign, uh, foreign powers. And you mentioned just as, as kind of a follow up, like your own project, like um, at least the book project, like it, it's temporarily bounded, right? It says, it says in the title 1941, 1965. But you've mentioned, for example, a couple kind of like, I think, uh, dates that maybe resonate with the wider public, you know, the uh, the removal of Mossad the coup against Mossad uh, Mossadegh in, in 1953, and then the Iranian Revolution in 1978-79. So, so why why though why did you choose your dates as what kind of what what puts the, the boundaries on historical projects with the knowledge, of course, that, you know, history is always messy and no end dates and start dates and stuff like that. So. Sure, sure. So I have, I have uh, two answers to that question. Um, okay. the, first, the first answer is that as I was putting the project together, 
I was finding the mid 1960s to be a very natural stopping point for the story of how Americans are involved in Iran's development, economic development program. So you start in the 1940s and there are American advisors all over Iran assisting Iran's state during uh, World War II. Iran was under occupation by the British and the Soviets. Americans were there as advisors. And these advisory missions continue all the way through the 40s, the 50s. They kind of uh, transform into these kind of non-state uh, bodies, corporations like Lilienthal's company, development and resources, uh, NGOs like the Ford Foundation uh, or the Near East Foundation. And they're there all the way up until the mid 1960s, where the Shah essentially kicks them out. And he does so under the aegis of what he calls his white revolution. And in Iranian history, the white revolution is this significant moment where the Shah consolidates his power. And he does so through a program of modernization and land reform. And in telling the story of Iranian history, telling the story of the Shah's reign, the White Revolution, which happens around 1963 to 1965, is usually taken as the moment where the Shah becomes the single most powerful figure in the country. So seeing that connection in my work between Americans being pushed out of Iran's development program and the White Revolution, I found it to be a very convenient, very, uh, very, um, it made sense as an endpoint to the story because American influence within the, the development program kind of ceased to uh, cease to be there. With on the oil side, the companies which were still there and still ran the show for all intents and purposes, in the mid 1960s, they also start to come under continuous pressure from the Shah to give him more money, to improve their terms. And you start to see at that point, a switch in their relationship with who has more power, the Shah or the companies. So the mid sixties made sense, 65 made sense as kind of the end point of the two stories I was trying to tell about global, uh, global oil and local oil, local development. The second answer I'll say is 41 to 79 is a very long time to cover in one book. And I'm currently working on a second book which covers 65 to 79. Ooh, fancy. <laughs> Okay, so since you're working on a second book, I, I have a question that like, I think a lot of people, when they study US history, um, it really confuses them when they get to the 70s because they hear this thing called OPEC and then they hear the oil crisis. And then they, we immediately jump to like stuff like domestic history, uh, in domestic history, stagflation, all this kind of right. stuff. And right. then when you get to grad school, everyone's like, oh, the shock of the 1970s, you know, the global, the global 1970s was crazy. Um, everyone's like obsessed with the 1970s right now. Now that 1980s are finally getting cool, thank God. So my, my question is mainly for the viewers, like how does- I worked on the 50s, what, so I'm not cool. Yeah. <laughs> what, what role does Iran play in, in OPEC and how does OPEC sort of affect the United States in, in, its, you know, in its role in, in this global oil economy in the 1960s and 70s? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I'm going to temper my answer somewhat by saying that this is a huge part of my, my, my new project, um, is the US-Iranian relationship um, during a period of global economic transformation, which is the 1970s. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the pivot of the next project. Um, Iran plays an enormous role in OPEC during this period and in the shock of 73-74. It's really the Shah, personally, who is the principal price and production hawk. Uh, there are other members of OPEC who want a higher price, but who want lower production. There are members who want to increase production, but want a more stable price. The Shah wants both of them to go up considerably at the same time. And he exerts tremendous influence over OPEC during the period where uh, the price shock occurs, this is late 73 until early 74. Um, and is pivotally important uh, uh, for a, a meeting in, in January of 74, where OPEC agrees on kind of a compromise price um, that ends up being you know, 400 times greater than what the price had been three months before. And it's principally due to the Shah's pressure that the price goes up to, by such a considerable degree. Now, it's very complicated to say the price of oil increased. That's actually a very, very complicated assertion because what you mean by price depends on what context you're talking in. If you're talking about OPEC, the price is actually only a reference point uh, referring to what kinds of taxes the companies are paying 
the countries for the oil that they're taking. I know that that sounds kind of wonky, um, but that is literally what they're talking about. They're not actually talking about how much the oil is being sold for at any point. They're talking about how much they're charging the companies to take their oil. The export taxes, basically. Essentially, yes, essentially. It's, a, it's an income tax on, uh, it's, it's part of a complicated formula that the companies and the countries work out in the 60s, actually, uh, uh, based on a previous agreement from the 50s. Oil history can get very technical <laughs> and can get quite confusing. So I, I'm, I'm doing my best to simplify it. But the price of oil, you know, what you're paying at the pump is also going up at the same time, but it's going up for reasons that are related to OPEC, but are also related to changes in the supply demand balance, are related to changes in the domestic economy, the US domestic economy, due to the decision to end import quotas, you know, the failure of US companies to invest in domestic production in the late 1960s, a rapid increase in consumption uh, in the late 60s, early 70s that uh, production just can't keep up with. Um, so the oil shock, I mean, what you ask is kind of, for me, a pivotal question, because the oil shock of 73, 74 is often pinned on OPEC and pinned on actors like the Shah, but at the same time is resulting from syst uh, systematic changes, you know, changes to uh, sort of macroeconomic trends that really no one is responsible for. It's kind of all happening at once. So how do you, like in a situation like that, I, I think that, that that's a really interesting question for a historian, and not just historians to kind of deal with this. How do you balance kind of systemic issues with individual agency? Like, I mean, like, how do you, how do you negotiate that in your own work? Yeah, it, it is kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question because um, particularly when studying oil, there is a tendency to imagine, sometimes to imagine agency where none exists. So, you know, conspiracy theories, essentially, you know, the companies are behind this, the companies are behind that, the companies wanted Mossadegh gone, poof, he's gone, you know, and this, this makes for, this makes for easier narratives, I think, mm -hmm. um, whereas the actual answers to, you know, why things happen the way that they happen can get much more, you know, can get a lot gooier and can get a lot more, a lot less satisfying when you start to pull in, you know, big macroeconomic changes or, you know, minute changes in how investment is being uh, made in domestic energy production that then have consequences, you know, five or six years later, when suddenly there isn't enough domestic oil production to meet domestic needs and you have to start importing more. Um, you know, big changes happen in the 1960s. Europe starts importing huge amounts of oil from Libya, which, you know, is right there across the Mediterranean. And they do so for a variety of reasons, one of which is Libya is ruled by a pro-Western monarchy, King Idris. In 1969, King Idris is kicked out and Muammar Gaddafi becomes uh, the leader of Libya. And suddenly Libya becomes a lot less, a lot less uh, attractive as a source of oil, but there's not much that the Europeans can do about it. And that becomes a running issue throughout the whole, you know, throughout the whole shock is that these, not only the United States, but, all, but principally Western Europe and Japan who are far more dependent on imported oil than the US uh, are very concerned about quote unquote energy security. You know, importing oil from countries that don't appear to be favorable to the West, but at the same time are selling oil continuously throughout this whole period. So even the concept of energy security becomes nebulous, uh, becomes kind of, if you like, a fiction being imagined in the heads of American policymakers uh, who, who think that, you know, we need to send troops to the Middle East to safeguard the oil, when in reality, Oil producing countries have a vested interest in selling oil and have done for, for decades. Um, so pulling apart agency from you know, systemic uh, factors, trying to distinguish between you know, who is making what decisions when and how is that influencing the situation as opposed to the market, right? Yeah. How do we factor in something like the market, which oil historians talk about constantly, but who, you know, which they rarely theorize. You know, what is the oil market? How does it work? What is price? You know, I kind of threw that out there a few minutes ago. These are questions that I'm currently wrestling with um, uh, as I'm kind of diving into the 70s. Uh, so in a way, I don't have satisfactory answers to these questions yet, but hopefully I will in, you know, four to five years. Uh, before we get to audience questions, because there's a couple of really great questions 
Uh, another aspect of your book title is, you know, or another aspect of what you research is, is the Cold War, right? And you mentioned a little bit how Iran sort of uses positive equilibrium to balance the Soviet Union and the, and the British Empire or and, and the British. But Iran was also a member of the non-aligned movement, correct? Or was it not? Not really, no. Um, and, this and is, so, it's, yeah. So Go like base so since it wasn't, what role does Iran play or not play in the US Soviet conflict during the so, period you study? It, it is like so so far shit, like it's not I, I wouldn't consider it a member of the non-aligned movement. I wouldn't consider it uh, you know a neutralist country, certainly not under the Shah. Yeah. Um, it's very much US aligned, it's very much aligned with the West. Um, however, there is an older school of thought that posits the Shah is kind of a Western stooge. You know, he's sort of a tool of the West. He's that Iran is a, a US client state. And I don't think that's the case. I think Iran very much pursues its own foreign policy that the Shah and the Pahlavi regime have uh, interests of their own. And the Shah as a figure on the international stage in the 60s, particularly after that 65 point, particularly after that mid 1960s turning point where I end my first book and where I hope, hopefully, you know, we'll pick things up in my second book, the Shah becomes very assertive as an actor in international relations. And while it's usually, you know, supporting the United States, Iran becomes kind of the key US uh, representative, if you like, in the Persian Gulf after the British withdrawal in 1971. That's part of the reason why the United States under Richard Nixon becomes so willing to furnish the Shah with advanced weaponry. Um, there's the famous meeting where, where Nixon agrees to offer Iran a blank check, uh, giving them any non-nuclear weapon systems they want. Um, but these are in pursuit of Iranian goals that the Shah has. Um, and the Shah is very vocal about Iran being an independent state that's pursuing its own independent policy. And you can see, you know, you can see that happening with things like the oil shock, with things like the price shock, a decision that the Shah makes knowing that it will have economic repercussions for the West, for the United States, um, but does so in pursuit of his own interests. So, I mean, it's kind of what you mentioned earlier. What's fascinating people about the 70s is because it's it's a moment of tremendous change. It's a moment of tremendous, uh, seemingly of tremendous transition. And one of those transitions is uh, you know, the shift in the balance of power away from Western oil companies and Western powers towards oil producing states like Iran and organizations like OPEC, which seem to wield more power. Uh, whether they do in reality, I think is a, is a, is a very interesting question that uh, you know, uh, folks like Daniel Sargent have written about and which I'm hoping to write about as well. So I, I think that that's a nice transition, in fact, to um, the the second half hour, where we have some some great questions from the audience. And um, so one of the first questions um, Sharon asks is is about your research. Is were you able or have you been able in the past to access um, Iranian archives? Like, is that part of your research? Like, have you been able to travel to Iran? Like, kind of what's that like? How has it impacted you? You know, kind of how you have approached your project, either this one or kind of going forward. Next one. That's a very good question, and it's a very important question. Um, I unfortunately wasn't able to travel to Iran and to visit Iranian archives. Uh, it's something that I regretted quite tremendously, but it simply wasn't practical um, for a variety of reasons. Um, timing didn't actually work out too great. Uh, I had been exploring the possibility um, for 2017. I had been doing some explore, you know, exploratory work in 2016. This was a year after the nuclear agreement was signed. This was before the 2016 election. And uh, I was thinking like, well, maybe there's a chance. And then in 2017, it very quickly became clear that this was not something that was going to be a good idea. Uh, and I was, you know, I, I, I had reached out to uh, various concerned uh, parties and was essentially told that it wasn't a very good idea. So I sort of, I pulled back from that. Um, it is, of course, possible to do research in Iranian archives, and many scholars have done so. Many, uh, uh, you know, historians and um, anthropologists, uh, and so forth. Um, and the archives are there, and they have a tremendous volume of, of documents pertaining to these subjects. But I unfortunately wasn't able to look at them. What I was able to do was work in um, memoirs um, in Persian and in French and English. Uh, there's a tremendous number of interviews with figures from this period that are available both in published form and also online through the Foundation of Iranian Studies and through the um, Harvard University Iran Oral History Project. Um, 
What was very helpful to me was that these resources are very rich when it comes to Iran's development um, program during the 50s and 60s. Uh, the program was run by uh, an institution called the Plan Organization, the Iranian Plan Organization, and various high-ranking uh, technocrats, officials, administrators sat for very long interviews during the 1980s where they talked a great deal about the kind of work that was being done during this period. So I was very lucky to have access to those kinds of uh, resources. But um, it's it's uh, something that I regret not being able to have done. It is something I am hoping to one day get to do. Um, but that, of course, is not a, not entirely up to me. Yeah, is that um, you know kind of if I could just very briefly follow up. I mean, like as a medievalist, right? Like like European archives is kind of the lifeblood of kind of the work that you do, and then it really varies on um, how digitized um, a lot of this material is. Like, have you found that Iranian archives are starting to digitize things? Are they digitizing things? Like, is that helping kind of open things up or make things available or is it just not happening? That's not a question I think I can answer. Um, mm. my, gut, my gut answer would be no, mm. because my understanding is that um, the national archives in Tehran and then other archives, such as the foreign ministry archives, have quite specific rules about how you can look at documents and then okay. how you can scan them. Um, I, I, I did know uh, at one point the, the particular practice that they, sure. that they sort of forced researchers to use. I, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I believe it involves um, CDs or, or um, oh, really? USB drives, something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, some, it's a fairly elaborate system that they require researchers to use. Again, I'm, I'm not, entirely conversant on how that happens. But if there are digitized records that they have made available, um, at least from you know ministry archives, at least from sort of state archives, there are a large number of newspapers that are available online Okay. Um, from this period. Iran has a very vibrant press, particularly from 1941 to 1953. There are dozens of newspapers that are running because um, this is a period where there, there is actually a free press in Iran. Um, before and after this period, not so much. Um, so a lot of those are available online or are available in places like the Library of Congress or um, some university libraries have, have copies on microfilm. So I, I would encourage people who wanna do research uh, on Iran who have the language skills to, to look at resources like that if they're not able to go to Iran and do research there. Thank you. One of the, one of the best questions, uh, a great question that is from Helen um, and it's sort of, it's, I see a similar issue when I'm doing my research is how to sort of assess American knowledge, American policymakers and experts knowledge of, of other countries, right? So for in my case, it's India uh, and how, how I should sort of understand their biases and racism. And so Helen asks how you assess the knowledge of American policymakers about these Middle Eastern countries, specifically Iran, and you know, how does sort of racism or, or sort of bias sort of affect that? That's a fantastic question. And it's one that actually played a huge role in um, my book, in my project. Um, I haven't really talked about it uh, before now, um, but when I was doing work in US archives, I saw a very, very prominent strain of what most people would refer to as Orientalism, um, this kind of reductive, uh, presumptive view of Middle East culture, Middle East history, Middle East people, Middle East society, and the functioning of Middle East politics. Um, as I did more research, I actually found American policymakers and American developmentalists and even oil company executives all shared a similar outlook. And the outlook that they shared was something that I ended up referring to as Iranian incapacity. So their particular view, the, their, the, I would say the direction in which their knowledge led them because I think, I mean, you know, analyzing the creation of knowledge or the assumption of knowledge can lead us in so many different methodological directions. Um, this was kind of one that I followed. Um, whether or not they knew what they were talking about, I think in, in many cases is sort of beside the point because they were wielding power and they imagined that they had knowledge and they were acting on that knowledge. So their view of Iranian incapacity essentially boiled down to this, that Iran was a country struggling against modernity that it was a country being led by individuals who were corrupt, who were, who had sort of presumptions towards modernity, but who were incapable of carrying out reform 
who are incapable of administrating complex projects, particularly development projects. There are endless diatribes, endless reports, telegrams, complaints from Americans about how Iranians don't seem to know how to spend the money that they are getting from oil, how they require American expertise, they require American know-how. And this assumption of Iranian incapacity runs throughout this whole period, it runs throughout my entire book. It's crucially important to how the Americans approach the coup of 53, this idea that Iran cannot run itself without oil is also a factor. Um, and it also runs into the conclusion of the book in mid-1963, where the Americans decide, uh, sort of for lack of a better option from their point of view, that they would leave the country in the hands of the Shah, that the Shah was sort of the one figure, the one person, you know, this dictator was the one force who could lead a country uh, that appeared incapable of modernizing into modernity and would do it in a way that was conducive to US interests. And a final point was that there was a kind of, there was again, there was a cleavage in the American community, American policymaking community. There were those who found this idea extremely appealing, who thought the Shah was a sincere, capable uh, uh, leader who would bring Iran towards stability, the American idea of stability. Um, or at the very least would provide order, as so many other sort of US-backed uh, dictators would do in the 1960s and, and, and so forth throughout the Cold War. But there were also quite a few in the American diplomatic community, the development community, who thought that this would never work, that what Iran needed was some form of democratic government, and it wasn't going to get that under the Shah, and that, that and they were making these predictions in 1963. They were saying, if this continues, if we leave Iran in the hands of an oil-backed dictator, eventually there will be a social revolution. And of course there was. Interesting. Um, I, there's a, another really great question um, and I, I sort of want to add to it. So Paul asks about how the Iranian revolution sort of affects the production and pricing of oil. Um, but I sort of want to add to it and ask how does, after 1979, what is, how do we get to Iran and US today? That's a really big question, I know, but like, how does, does 1979 sort of affect not just the oil production and pricing in Iran, but does 19, 1979 also affect how we got to US Iran today? Sure, so on the first point, um, 79 is another oil shock. Uh, um, and it's, it's a shock that's actually quite different from the shock of 73, 74. What happens is, you know, in 1978, really all throughout the year, there are demonstrations, there's violence, there's growing revolutionary organization going on within Iran, and the Shah's regime, the Shah's government is increasingly incapable of managing it. In late 1978, um, there are massive strikes that break out in Iran's oil fields. And as a result of these strikes, Iran's oil production plummets from 6 million barrels a day to less than 2 million barrels a day. And given how much Iran was producing, this, by the way, is an amount of oil that Iran has yet to reach in the years since. The Iranian oil production reached its peak in the late 1970s under the Shah. Due to this sudden disappearance of supply, prices worldwide skyrocketed because suddenly there wasn't enough supply to meet demand. So there was a second oil shock in 79 as the result, essentially, of the res as the result of the revolution. So that kind of answer, I hope that answers that first question. The second question is a big question. Um, there are, I think, a lot of answers to it. Um, what I will say is this, part of the problem the United States ran into with the Islamic revolution, two problems really. The first problem was that Iran was a very important country to the United States. Had this revolution happened in another country, it may not have affected US policy in quite the same way, but Iran was playing, to the United States, was playing a very important role regionally. It was playing an important role in the Cold War. And the sudden, and the Shah was, you know, had been a fixture of US Cold War diplomacy for 25 years at this point. So this, his sudden disappearance, you know, was another shock from which, uh, you know, American policymakers kind of had a hard time managing, which was of course followed, you know, the Shah leaves in January of 1979. In November of 1979 is the hostage crisis. The embassy is overrun. American hostages are taken at the US embassy in Tehran. And then this is a crisis. This is a, a you know, a, an issue that then 
is carried on for over a year and you know, forms an immense cleavage between Iran's new government and the Carter administration, the US government, and also forms a cleavage between the people of Iran and the people of the United States, which to a certain extent has yet to be fully resolved. You know, um, the emotional impact, the trauma of the hostage crisis is something that is still being, you know, is still kind of being dealt with whenever American, whenever American politicians, American media, American uh, journalists write about Iran, they inevitably bring up the events of November of 1979, you know, even 40 years later. So in that sense, we are still living in a world uh, that was made in that year and that was made in 79. Obviously, a you know, tremendous amount has changed since then, but there has yet to be, you know, there has yet to be a resolution. The United States has yet to figure out what kind of policy it has towards Iran, because since 79, the policy has generally been one of confrontation, containment, suspicion, aggression, distrust, and you know, no communication. And that's not really a policy that can continue forever towards a country of you know, 90 million people that um, is for, you know, whether you like it or not, is an important country and an important part of the world. So I'm curious too about like in the period that you're particularly interested, at least in this, sorry, in the first project, not the, the second project. <laughs> yeah, we gotta keep them in order. But, yeah, um, is, um, so, uh, you know, were there moves to kind of, uh, to remove Iran from the critical role that it played, or was 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 the um, was the, the the political diplomacy of the um, the Iranian uh, government first um, the prime minister and then the then the, the Shah afterwards like did it always keep itself in the mix or was was the U.S. the one at least in US, the way the U.S. approached foreign policy the one who kept Iran in the center of that that conversation. That's a great question, um, and and sort of by, by that I mean I take your meaning to be you know. Iran's place in the Cold War, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah. So, so that is a very interesting question. So, Mohammad Mossadegh, um, who is uh, he's a secular nationalist constitutionalist, becomes prime minister in 1951, nationalizes Iran's British-owned oil industry, sort of starts this big crisis between Iran, Great Britain, and kind of the rest of the world. Um, but what Mossadegh is most interested in, I mean, oil is important, but what he's most interested in is Iran really, Varsha, becoming a member of what is going to become the non-aligned movement. Mossadegh yeah. is a neutralist. He's, his policy, I had mentioned before this idea of positive equilibrium. You know, Iranian politicians uh, wary of Iran's weakness, balancing foreign powers against one another. Mossadegh's policy is what he called negative equilibrium. This idea that Iran should be separate, that it should be independent, that it should have amicable relations with everyone, but should not be a pawn in games of international relations. That's literally uh, quote for quote what Nehru says to like the U.S. ambassador. Yeah, yeah, uh, Ambassador Loy Henderson. Yeah, uh, no, this is the ambassador uh -huh. in uh, the forties. Okay, because Henderson was ambassador to India in the late forties, and then became ambassador to Iran from fifty-one yes. to fifty-four. Yes, no, it is Henderson. It is. It is Henderson. Henderson. Yeah. Ah, see, a, a quirky thing about this is that you just keep seeing the same people pop up and again and again, which helps to explain why the it helps to explain why the policies are all so coherent because it's the same people yeah. making them. Um, so this idea of Iran not playing a role in the Cold War was very concerning to U.S. policymakers because Iran was important. Now, Matt, you asked why was Iran important? Well, America considered it important for two reasons: geography was one. It had a 1400 mile long border with the Soviet Union. You know, we, we tend to forget that, you know, all of Central Asia was part of the Soviet Union as was the entire Caucasus. Yeah. So Iran was a country sitting right there on, you know, the Southern border of the Soviet Union, which to the Americans, to the United States made it an important country. The second reason, which was also kind of geographical was that given Iran's place straddling Central Asia, the Middle East, the Mesopotamia, and the Persian Gulf, as well as the oil fields of the Persian Gulf. Excuse me. If Iran were to quote unquote fall to communism, it would suddenly imperil the security of Middle East oil. It would make the defense of pro-Western countries elsewhere in the Middle East essentially untenable. It would push country. This is all in the minds of American policymakers, by the way. Right. It would it would push Turkey towards a neutralist course. You know, this idea of falling dominoes is already there in the late 40s, early 50s 
you know, as far as Iran is concerned. So the coup of 53, right, the CIA MI6 overthrows Mossadegh. This coup occurs for sort of two reasons. One is to end the oil crisis and restart the flow of Iranian oil. The other is to put a government in place in Tehran that is pro-US and anti-communist. And that's a government run by the Shah that is you know, connected to the military and Iran's kind of traditional conservative aristocracy. And that is how the United States pulls Iran back into the Cold War. Um, a war which Mossadegh, speaking for many Iranians, didn't want to be a part of. So I have a question that we usually ask people. Uh, when you teach US Iranian history, if you get a chance to teach Iran in any of your classes, do you ever use any popular culture or books? Like what is a, what is a movie or book that you actually like to assign because it's actually good or because it's like really, really bad? It's like, for example, I despise Argo. I think it's a horrible movie, but that terrible just might film. be me. It's a terrible okay. film. Good. Is, do you show that because it's terrible? No, no, I don't. I don't show it. Um, I don't show Argo. Um, what do I show? I try to show. So when I talk about the nationalization crisis, I like to show British newsreels mm. because the British had this thing where they thought the Iranian oil industry was theirs, like that it was British. Delusional. I love so, it. So so after Mossadegh nationalizes, there are these great newsreels where it's like Mossadegh nationalizes British oil in Abadan. When will the British be asked to leave? You know, when, when will we be kicked out of Iran? We were kicked out of India. When, when will we be kicked out of Iran? And then they interview company employees and the company employees are like, I've worked here my whole life. You know, I live down the street, you know? And it's like, it's to them, Abadan is- You have British... amazing impressions. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I did, I showed that to my students because I said like, look, the British, care deeply about this because to them, this is theirs. Um, and, and then I try to show, you know, I show them excerpts from Mossadegh's speeches or speeches from, from other national front uh, figures, you know, where they talk about, you know, this is Iran's oil. This is Iranian natural resources. This is Iranian territory. This all belongs to us. We let you here, you know, 50 years ago. Now it's time for you to leave and, and to allow us to run our own oil industry. So that's something I show. I also like, um, I like, I, I show this once, um, Persepolis, the animated film, mm. which is in French, uh. but French is actually kind of a, a, a resonant language in Iran because it, in, in the, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, a lot of Iranians um, sent their children, sort of well-to-do Iranians sent their children to French schools, French universities. Mossadegh was actually uh, uh, educated in Switzerland. And so French became kind of a language of the middle and upper class. Uh, and I like the film because it, uh, it, 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 sh it captures the kind of clash of cultures very well or, and the sense of confusion that the revolution creates for Iranians who you know, sort of didn't feel a part of the Khomeini movement, didn't feel that as though the Islamic Republic was something that they had, you know, had a, had a say in. Um, so I, I, I like that, but I, I'm, I'm trying to remember others. I, I should use more, honestly. It ends up being like lots of, you know, Fruce documents and, and you know, lots of foreign policy stuff, which pro they probably all find boring, but I, I think it's cool. Uh, I mean, Persepolis is a really wonderful, um, at first it was a graphic novel and then it was exactly yeah, made yeah, into a yeah. movie. So there's there's lots of material there. Um, Rachel did, uh, we, we have another audience question. Is like, is there a place that people can see the newsreels online? Are they freely available or are they archived somewhere? A lot of them are on YouTube. Um, so if you, okay. if, you Google, if you Google Abadan, A-B-A-D-A-N, I can put it in the chat. Um, let me do that. So Abadan... 1951, a, a lot of them will come up because they're sort of BBC newsreels because it was a huge deal for the British. Um, it's actually one of the issues that leads to the fall of the Clement Attlee government and the return of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill oh. is, comes back as prime minister. Uh, and he famous, I think he famously says like, oh, we could, because this is after they've been kicked out of Abaddon. The British leave Abaddon in September 51. Churchill is elected the following month. Or there's a there's an election the following month, and Churchill says like uh, we could have kept Abaddon with a splutter of musketry. <laughs> we could have kept it with force, which yeah. they actually what? they wanted to do. The British had a military plan, and the Americans said no. And Attlee was smart enough to know in '51 
if we make a military intervention in a Middle East country and we don't have US support, it won't go well, which is yeah. something Anthony Eden should have known about five years later when he invaded Egypt in 1956. <laughs> and they learned their lesson then. That's a little Suez I, reference. I have a slightly not relevant question, but just a little bit relevant. I just watched The Fog of War, which is the documentary of Robert McNamara. And so The Fog of War is all about like Vietnam and McNamara's disastrous yeah. ideas in Vietnam. Uh, it doesn't talk about his time as the World Bank, and it doesn't really talk about any other countries except Vietnam. So I was wondering, in your research, does McNamara ever talk about Iran? Like, is his craziness, not craziness, is his interesting perspective ever given on Iran, either at the World Bank or when he's Secretary of Defense? That's a great question, Varsha, and I want to answer it, but I can't do it yet because I haven't gone through those World Bank docs. Um, but I'm actually really interested in what kind, because the World, the World Bank, has this fascinating history with Iran that covers this entire period that very rarely gets discussed. Um, the World Bank lends hundreds of millions of dollars to Iran in the 1960s and 70s that play a huge role in um, the nation's development programs. Um, so I, I imagine that McNamara did have uh, some thoughts on Iran, um, and hopefully I'll be able to find out what those were once I get to World Bank archives. So yeah, it's a good question that I myself have, and I can't wait to find out what the answer is. Yeah, I, I do have so, a recommendation to people who are watching, though. If you watch The Fog of War, oh, man. I, I've good. never, I don't like documentaries, but this is like a wild documentary. It's more of a long form interview, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. just sort of his interview, um, you know, made more entertaining. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's already it's very like, entertaining, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we are running a little bit low on time, but, but a couple of people have asked, um, based upon kind of an offhand comment about pop culture, why, why is Fargo, why is Argo so bad? Not Fargo, Fargo is great. Why is Fargo's Argo great. so bad? Um, what is it like, so how does it portray things? Like, what is it like, and I know this, this could probably be an extraordinarily expansive answer, but um, what are your thoughts? Um, okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. Um, the first is the ending is a fabrication. Um, okay. The sort of the white knuckled escape from, uh, you know, Merhabad airport uh, where they're being chased by comites. You know, that's, 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 that was just added to the movie to give it some tension at the end, which is fine. You know, it's a movie, I, I get that. Sure. Um, the thing I have more of a problem with is this very reductive depiction of what the revolution was, how it happened. And it also, it, it, it you know, the common belief at the time was that Iran had just descended into total chaos and that was it was being run by thugs and criminals. Um, and to a certain extent, that was true. There was violence and there was, there was a great deal of instability. But the film, to me, it, it sort of leans just too hard on that kind of uh, reductive depiction, this idea that this is just a country filled with madmen that these you know, poor, innocent white Americans need to escape from. Um, but, you know, that's the whole purpose of the film. So I can't, you know, I can't, I can't necessarily knock it for not trying to find more nuance in, in that. I was mostly just disappointed that a big, you know, a big budget American film had been made about the revolution and had just not bothered to do anything to change how most Americans perceive the revolution, which is just this, yeah. this violent moment where nice looking, you know, modern Iranian uh, modern Iranian government was overthrown by just gangs of, of you know, militants. Um, it was a great deal more complicated than that. Yeah. yeah. Another, like, I, I doubt you watch oh, these shows. Terrible. But like, Homeland and Madam Secretary also wildly misrepresent Iran. I mean, most TV shows that are like, this is foreign policy and we're secret agents and we're in the Middle East. Uh, they're really bad at representing the Middle East. But like, Homeland yeah. specifically, also, Madam Secretary. Madam Secretary goes in like, it's not a great show, but it goes in like the total opposite direction. It makes the leaders of Iran like seem like these like, you know, sages and saints, like deeply orientalistic. And it's like, it's really funny. Yeah. Also, it's not good. Yeah. But. No, no. I mean, these things really are, you know. Yeah. Well, it seems to play into, I mean, like as a medievalist, I mean, one of the things we always confront is this movie Kingdom of Heaven, which is a movie about, uh, you know, the Crusades, right. which again, like about, it was really kind of about the, I mean, it's a lot about the Iraq war, which was, um, right. you know, had started just a, a year or so before the film was released. But again, like the, this idea that any sort of religious understanding or religious activity is, 
irrational, violent, thuggish, anything like that. And so it's, it's just this, this kind of wave of the early 2000s kind of filmmaking. Um, yeah. And again, like, like the, the, the power of these Orientalist tropes, right, which just kind of suffuse popular understandings and unfortunately some ac um, academic understandings of, of this period and this, this time, so. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I really, note. can I ask one more question, Matt? No, yes, of course. Okay, okay, so one more question. We didn't get to ask this because it's not really history related, but obviously for the past, what, what is it, five years since Donald Trump was elected in January, 2017. So since January, 2017, the whole country at off times and on times has been like talking about the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, mm -hmm. And like people, it's been years since it's been signed. It's literally been, it was signed in 2015, right? It, it so had it's, its sixth anniversary yesterday. Yeah, and so it's been six years since it's signed, but like still more than half the country doesn't really understand it. And another thing that we don't really fully understand is why is it now that European countries are like, this is during Trump, but also even now, right, that they're pro, you know, not putting on more sanctions. And like the US is the only one that's like interested in keeping these sanctions. Like how is Iran sort of dealing with Europe versus the United States today? Okay, so that's another big question. Um, I'll oh, try to answer it in one minute. All right, in one <laughs> minute. Um, uh, honestly, so it, the deal was Iran would, um, uh, it would destroy a lot of its nuclear infrastructure, it would reduce the number of centrifuges that it was operating, it would reduce the amount, you know, it would, it would cease to enrich past a certain level, it would allow inspectors in, blah, 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 blah. Essentially, a lot of safe, safeguards to let the international community see that it wasn't developing a nuclear weapon. In exchange, it gets sanction relief. For Europe, that meant more, arguably, than to the United States, because Iran is a larger trading partner to Europe than it is to the United States, due to you know, geography, history, you know, commercial ties, etc. So when Trump exited the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, in 2018, there was immediate pushback from the Europeans, both because they were like, why are you exiting a deal that you made? Why is the United States leaving a deal for no reason that it made with not just Iran, but us and other members of the international community? We don't like that. Also, you know, we'd like to do more business with Iran. It's a giant, you know, it's an enormous country. It has a huge market. It has a lot of untapped natural resources, oil and gas being, you know, two of them. So the Europeans cared a great deal about salvaging the deal uh, and continue to do so. They continue to be very involved. From Iran's point of view, uh, you know, for a long time, they kind of tried to use the Europeans as leverage against the United States. The Europeans were going to put together a special sort of quote unquote vehicle to assist with, you know, the movement of, you know, financial exchanges around US sanctions that didn't really get off the ground. Um, where they are now, is the United States and Iran are talking very slowly and very methodically about putting the deal back in place. A deal which, by the way, Iran never formally left. Only the United States left the deal. As far as sanctions going back, I mean, this is kind of fuzzy territory because the United States under Trump put a whole bunch of new sanctions on Iran, which Biden, now president, said, you know, we want to go back to the nuclear deal, but he's maintaining the Trump era sanctions until that happens, uh, which to some looks a little disingenuous, but to others just looks like diplomacy. You know, if you have leverage, you use it. Um, as far as whether the deal goes back into place, I honestly don't know, because now Iran has a new government, it has a new president, uh, or, it, you know, Abraham Raisi is, you know, replaced Hassan Rouhani. Uh, the country's still being run by the same supreme leader, so there hasn't been a change there, but, you know, whether the deal ends up going back into force is uh, still to be determined. Yeah, we'll have to have you back on for a whole other yes. discussion on what happens from 79 to 2021. That's exactly. your third book. Exactly. Yeah. I can do that in about 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much, Greg, um, for, for joining us. It's been a really great conversation. Thank you, everyone, for, for spending your Friday evening or afternoon, wherever you are um, with us. Uh, next week, we'll be back again. Um, we're going to have Tracy Franklin back on, our friend from Uncle Nearest uh, Tennessee Whiskey. We'll be talking about whiskey history and um, different tastings and stuff like that. Should be great. This might be the moment that you see either myself or Varsha fall down. Um, totally drunk with the number of tastings we have to do, but we'll we'll soldier on. This is our our service to all of you. So, yeah. I say one last thing. I'm sorry to I'm sorry to everyone that I drank the whiskey on the rocks. It was delicious. Um, it was a tactical choice. 
Um, Matt agrees uh, with you. It's okay. No, this is this is a hundred percent. You are correct. Varsha is the one that's wrong. So don't don't worry. <laughs> I saw some objections to it in the Q and A. So for those who uh, you know who who felt uh, those uh, people are it. wrong. Those people are wrong. <laughs> Anyway, on that note, um, thank you again, everybody. Um, take good care. Greg, you, Greg, thank you again. And until then, cheers. Cheers. Thanks cheers. so much, Greg.